on me. How are you doing today, sir? It's all good. I guess so. I wanted to ask you a question of uh, last week was the uh, centenary centenary of Charles Mingus, and uh, we didn't discuss that. We uh, and I know uh, everyone is well, not everyone, but a lot of people were, are still very excited about your book, Jazz and Justice: Racism and the Political Economy of the Music. Could you talk about? Uh, you know Charles Mingus's role in 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 the in the music that we call jazz and, and uh, what are your what are your what are your thoughts on Mingus? I remember I'll say this and I'll shut up. Uh, one one of the first things I did when, before I, I I left Los Angeles, I saw Charles Mingus at Royce Hall at UCLA, and he threatened to jump off the stage and beat uh, uh, some Euro man up. But what do you remember about Mingus? Did you ever see him live? I don't think so. Although I saw the movie, the documentary that he yes. had, which I highly recommend. It probably could be found online. It's sort of sad and poignant because one of the penultimate scenes shows him being evicted from his place in Manhattan uh, quite yes. sadly. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite a come down for a genius musician. And of course, he grew up in Los Angeles, started composing as a teenager. Uh, for a while, called himself Barra after the Duke and Count Basie, he was going to be the Baron. And in addition to his still worth reading memoir, Beneath the Underdog, and, if, and I, th I think uh, an interview with him on Beneath, about, uh, Beneath the Underdog can be found online probably too. Um, he wrote politicized music, uh, the Haitian fight song, which we feature all the time on KPFK Freedom Now show, 11 a.m. Pacific, and then Fables of Faubus about the desegregation battle in Little Rock, Arkansas in 1957. And then with Max Roach, he tried to reclaim the fruits of its labor by starting this record company. I talk about that at length in, in, in Jazz and Justice. In the book. Right. But then ran up against organized crime and shark-like capitalists, etc. And uh, as I recall, he dies in Mexico uh, with a blanket, a Mexican blanket over him. And he had a relationship with uh, uh, a, 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 a musical relationship, I think, at the end of his life with, uh, uh, with Joni Mitchell, I believe. Yeah, I recall that. And uh, WKCR.org, the Columbia Radio uh, Station, Columbia University Station, they, they do specials on the giants of the music. They, they did one on Mingus on his Hunter's birthday. They did one just the other day on Duke Ellington on his birthday. Uh, they do them on Louis Armstrong. You know, the, the, they, they run the gamut. So people should check out that station. And you're listening to Dice Cork Music on Black Power 96. I have uh, uh, one, one more question, and I'll uh, let uh, Melinda jump in there. Uh, we're going into the NBA playoffs, and uh, Serge Obaka, who used to play with the Tor Toronto, played with Toronto, but I think he, if I'm not mistaken, I haven't been following like I should, I believe he is with the Milwaukee Bucks. Serge Obaka is from uh, Congo Brazzaville, and I know I've heard him give interviews in English, French, and Spanish. He's quite a, a phenomenal person and a great cook. Uh, is Serge still with the with the Bucks? And if he is, what role is he playing right now? Well, I'm not really sure, but this gives me the opportunity to <laughs> go off on a tangent about Brazzaville, which had a lot of impact on the Black Panther Party. That was during the days of the People's Republic of the Congo and the so-called Eldridge Cleaver faction of the Black Panther Party uh, by dint of their presence in Algiers and going back and forth to Paris, developed quite a relationship with the uh, other PRC, the People's Republic of the Congo, now the Republic of the Congo. And Congo Brazzaville, which is the smaller Congo, uh, maybe a population of about, what, four or five million as the larger Congo, right. about 80 to 90 million. 
but it was always a pace setter for so-called French West Africa uh, in terms of politics, in terms of fashion. Uh, a lot of the music we attribute to the larger Congo actually has its roots in the smaller Congo. So I should also say that many of the black folk in North America, whether they know it or not, have their roots uh, in the smaller Congo. Because keep in mind that the smaller Congo uh, lies at the mouth of the Congo River and, of course, abuts the Atlantic Ocean, which means that the slave ships would find it easier pickings to not go further into that part of Africa than the Congo, I mean, than the, the smaller Congo. And of course, in terms of pickings, the smaller Congo is not far distant from Angola, which was also a major hunting ground for enslaved Africans. So as they say nowadays, those are our peeps. Well, you, I'm, la I'm, I'm kind of laughing because of, Mike Iron Mike Tyson ha Iron Mike Tyson has roots in the Congo, and uh, Doctor Gerald Charles Horn Jr. Uh, Gerald Gerald Charles Horn, you have roots in Angola. If I'm not uh, putting your business in the street, well, that's what I've been told. But you know, I have to say I take it with a grain of salt. Well, that your your your, your sister was the one that discovered that, right? Yeah, yeah. But, you know, <laughs> okay, all right. I, I'd have to do my own investigation. All right. Have we, uh, oh, Congo Brazzaville, um, in terms of, uh, um, they had a, 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 a the people, the, supposedly the first People's Republic was in, uh, in Africa, was in Congo Brazzaville. Am I correct in saying that? Uh, I'm not sure if it was the first, but certainly it was one of the first. You remember when they had the stamps of uh, they had stamps of uh, uh, Coltrane, Malcolm. They had a lot of stamps with a uh, a lot of Africans from the continent and from the and the diaspora. And let me also say there there are references in my book on Southern Africa to the People's Republic of Congo and their relationship to Black Americans, and th that's a subject that somebody should follow up on. Um, likewise. I don't recall. I think I think also in my book on Southern Africa, there are references uh, to Madagascar on the other side of the continent. Oh, yeah. We talked about that last week. In, in terms we, talked about, of, we talked about that last week and the fact that that's where uh, uh, Kama Sankara embraced Marxism, Leninism, Mao Zedong. No, I shouldn't say. I guess he was a Mao Zedong thought man, but uh, uh, Sankara was, 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 was got his political education. We started embracing the revolution of socialism in Madagascar, right? We talked about that last week. Also on that same level, look at the New York Times book review today. They have a, a full page on an illustrated biography of Walter Rodney. It's this very, very interesting mm. illustration, I must say. I was a little taken aback, in fact. Who wrote it? Who wrote the review? Oh, I, I can't recall. It, it, it's. Uh, they take a page from an illustrated biography. So the question would be, who wrote the illustrated biography? The answer is, I can't recall. But it's you know you can find it easily online. And oh, is it, 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 uh, so I, I assume it's not too positive towards Walter. No, that's no. I was taken aback because it was positive. Yeah. Walter Anthony Rodney. Wal uh, Walter Anthony Rodney. War. Yeah. I had the pleasure of meeting, spending quite a bit of time with Walter Rodney. Did you ever get a chance to meet him? Well, you know, I was in Guyana right before he was assassinated. Yes. Oh, so oh, yeah, so you, oh yeah, okay. I remember meeting him in uh in um uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan, um, and uh, his son Shaka was was running around. In, in diapers at that particular time. The Shaka's a, I think Shaka's a big man in Barbados now. Have any questions, Belinda? 
Yeah, I don't know if you wanted to finish off the sport um, and, you know, talk about the M, the Major League Baseball prognosis. Well, as usual, uh, I'm uh, looking ahead to playoffs involving the Houston Astros, the St. Louis Cardinals, the New York Yankees, and one of the Southern California teams. But uh, we shall see. Uh, with regard to the basketball playoffs, I'm torn with regard to Boston and Milwaukee. I've already been forced to admit that I assume Boston's going to go all the way, but uh, Milwaukee will have a veto over that. And I was very disappointed to see the injury to Joel Embiid of Cameroon when apparently his countrymen uh, in Toronto uh, basically gave him a concussion and hurt his eye. So he may have to sit out for a while. Yeah, I saw that. You, you you sent that out in uh well you sent it out, but I remember that that that's, that's that is very big news, right? And uh, can we move on to uh, Ukraine weaken Russia or weaken China, and who has the advantage of that situation? Well, you know the the line from Washington is per the Pentagon chief Lloyd Austin is that they see this Ukraine crisis as weakening Russia. My point is that as usual, I'm not sure if the US ruling class has a comprehensive analysis because before the Ukraine crisis, the line was that they were gonna execute this pivot towards China. China's the ball game, China's the big enchilada. Now, the question is, instead of weakening Russia in the Ukraine, will US imperialism weaken itself? And Ukraine, or minimally, forestall the ability to confront China, given China breathing space. That's point number one. Point number two is that U.S. imperialism and its North Atlantic allies say they want to decouple their economy from that of China, which I understand because imperialism has become dangerously dependent upon China. But I don't see how they're going to do it. Uh, that is to say, in order to develop uh, alternative manufacturing capacity in Africa, for example, it's going to take years to build up the infrastructure. In any case, China's already building up infra infrastructure in Africa, tying it to the Chinese economy. And then with regard to engineers, the United States made a decision some years ago that they didn't want to uh, educate uh, black Science, science students. So they started uh, bringing students from China to populate the engineering programs, the physics programs, etc. So now they want to talk about deporting them all. But I don't see how they're going to do it because these programs need students and they would basically wither on the vine. So right now, it looks as if U.S. imperialism is kind of stuck along with their North Atlantic allies. But we shall see, because, you know, they pulled out in the 1970s when it seemed that they were stuck. And they were able, by dint, once again, of their alliance with China to execute the collapse of the Soviet Union by 1991. But part of the disappointment, I must say, uh, that I have here in North America is that I don't, I don't see that many uh, folks who are discussing this question or trying to tease out the larger implications. Now, usually when I say something like this, Norman, you, you'll talk about your comrades in St. Petersburg. Okay, fine. Let's stipulate your comrades in St. Petersburg, Florida are doing that. But other than that, I really don't, uh, I really don't see it. Well, you're going to be on uh, Time for Awakening, and you guys are going to be talking about the Ukraine. So I have another, uh, another, uh, I'll take another shot and say that. Well, yeah, Time yeah, for that's Awakening. one of the points you I'm going to raise. talk about it today. We're, we're, I'm going to be on at 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central, uh, discussing this issue. But it's it's sort of disappointing, and and, and people, and what, what what people need to realize is that. They have more, I think people might be afraid 
to discuss it because it, there's so much hysteria about the Ukraine now. People don't want <laughs> to break ranks or appear to break ranks. I understand that. But what they need to realize is that there is dissent on the right wing with regard to Ukraine. And that means that there's breathing space for those of us on the left wing. That's what they need to realize. That's one of the differences with the the Cold War and the Red Scare. There was no dissent, left, right, and center in in the United States amongst the Euro-American workers, middle class, and capitalists. Uh, And therefore, no dissent was allowed. Uh, But this issue is different. I'm sorry. Good job. Abayumi Azikwe, the uh, uh, he is another person that that uh, a, a, attempts to discuss the international uh, s- uh, situation. Pa- the Pan African Newswire. He he he. he uh, I don't know if he still does. He has a lot of international stuff, and I, I guess a lot of uh, of, of our uh, of comrades, uh, nationalists, black nationalist comrades. Don't want to discuss the Ukraine because it's a Caucasian country as opposed to a, a, it's not part of the Bandan world, not part of the African world, and not part of the Bandan world. Which I, uh, I guess, when I was 17 or 18 years old, I, that was my position. But uh, I broke with that position long, long time ago. Well, I mean, we're talking about possibly World War Three and the extinction of all humanity. So I guess they'll go to their deaths clinging to these beliefs. <laughs> you have any more questions, Belinda? Uh, yes. Uh, I just had to make sure I was not muted. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, do you want to put why Cop Kelling the Black um, black Bound to continue for a while in the USA, like all these yeah. Say that the again. Talk about the cop killing. Oh, 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 right, right, right. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I talked about that on um, KPFK Sojourner Truth this past Friday at uh, 10 p.m. Eastern, nine. Excuse me, 10 a.m. Eastern, 9 a.m. Central. And one of the points that I mentioned, I'm sure you you heard of the latest, speaking of the Republic of the Congo, how Patrick LaYoya was shot in the head in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I mean, it's just the the beat goes on. I mean, and I'm sure that listeners to this program will not be surprised when I say that this is an inevitable development here in the United States because – It stems from the fact that uh, the African population did not support the revolt against British rule that led to the formation of the United States of America because they did not engage in class collaboration as enslaved enslaved people and join hands with their slave masters, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison. And the so-called revolution was made against our interests. And as a result, we're still perceived as the enemy within the gates, which then helps to explain not only the cop killings, it explains our disproportionately being cited on death row. It helps to explain our disproportionate incarceration rates, et cetera, and the disproportionate cop killings. And what's similarly tragic is that a lot of people don't want to come to that bitter realization. Because I think if they did, it might force them to want to become revolutionaries, which means you're entering into more jeopardy. Or secondly, it might give you sleepless nights. But that's the sad state of affairs, I'm afraid to say. And could you talk about the growing evidence of uh, the attempted U.S. coup on the the first uh, January 6th of, uh, of 19 or 2021, I'm sorry. Well, there are going to be televised hearings next month. And according to Congressman Raskin of Maryland, they're going to blow the top off of the Capitol. 
because he's leaking evidence to suggest that Mike Pence, which we already sort of knew, the then U.S. vice president, was not on board with regard to the coup. And so the plan basically was to liquidate him. I mean, this is like a mafia movie stuff. And the slogan that you heard on January 6th, hang Mike Pence, apparently it came from the top. And in a, in a scene from a Hollywood thriller, supposedly Mike Pence's security wanted to hustle him away from the Capitol on January 6th as the mob invaded and were seeking him out. And he refused to leave. He knew about some sort of underground hiding place in the Capitol. And supposedly, the reason he refused to leave, and this is like the stuff from a Hollywood movie, he thought that his security was in cahoots with the Trump security. He wanted to liquidate him. <laughs> I mean, the, these people are, are, are too much. And as I pointed out in a lecture I gave that you can find online, or at least on the website of the Institute of Humanities of the University of Illinois at Chicago, I just gave this past week, that this was just the latest attempted counter-revolution, January 6, 2021, the attempt to make sure that Donald J. Trump stayed in power. A counter-revolution has been a central theme of the history of this so-called republic. Um, of course, um, even amateurs in history, I'm sure, recall 1876 when Reconstruction, the period following the U.S. Civil War, was derailed. And since it seems like I've been mentioning other projects I've been involved in, if you look online, at the website of the New York-based left-leaning weekly, The Nation. The site is thenation.com. You'll see a review essay that I did on the republication of Du Bois's magnum opus, Black Reconstruction. And in those pages, which are where I talk about the coup of 1876, I give Du Bois his proper respect, but I raise a point that we all need to consider, which is that in talking about 40 acres and a mule, in talking about the need to redistribute land to the formerly enslaved, Du Bois, like many, even today, does not engage the point that indigenous populations had a prior claim to the land, and even more sadly and tragically, for example, this will be, in, since I'm engaging in this, quote, self-promotion, unquote, this will be in my book on Texas, which will drop in a few weeks. So during this time in Reconstruction in Texas, the Black people in Texas were being lynched by the Ku Klux Klan in East Texas, whereas you had Black men, soldiers, Black male soldiers who were lynching Native Americans in West Texas as, as part of the Buffalo Soldiers. So th th this was unsustainable. I mean, how, how are you going to tolerate such a contradiction? And amongst other things, I would point the finger of accusation at the leadership. And, 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 and in this book, too, uh, with regard to leadership, I also make a critique of Native American leadership as well. Because as I'm going through researching and writing this book about Native American history in Texas, it always astonishes me why did they try to make an alliance with Russia against the United States or make an alliance with some other foreign power against the United States? And I would say the same thing to the black leadership. I mean, I mean folks are being lynched. I mean, don't, don't people not realize there's a world beyond North America? Or maybe that's too much to ask. In terms of the, uh, when did the, uh, who had the, uh, the? I guess the the the, the, the Haitians had a uh, had an international outlook. So would you say that in terms of they they had they they, they sought allies, I guess in, in Venezuela and other parts of the world, didn't they? Oh sure, but you know that uh, of course they had sovereignty. That 
But then Native Americans had sovereignty too. I mean, they, they were fighting to preserve their sovereignty. So the yes, Haitians, right. you know, they, they had diplomatic legations all over the world. For example. Now the black Americans, I guess you could say they didn't have sovereignty, so therefore they didn't have diplomatic legations. But you know, Frederick Douglass doing slavery, he was traveling to London, rallying abolitionist forces. But after that, you know, we got this, this, the, the formality of citizenship, I guess that meant you're not supposed to rally against the country of which you're a citizen, which doesn't make sense because we're still being lynched. I mean, so as was said in the United States about 20 years ago, after the United States got caught with his pants down as 3000 people died in New York and Washington on September 11, uh, there was a failure of imagination by the U.S. ruling elite. And that failure of imagination, I'm afraid to say, also could be said to characterize the black leadership and to a degree the Native American leadership. But rather than dwelling on that gloomy note, let me say that today is May Day, the workers' holiday. Uh, in many ways, born in USA, believe it or not. And if you look around the world, you, particularly since this is a Sunday and people have the day off anyway, in South Africa, I'm afraid to say that Cyril, President Cyril Ramaphosa, was chased from the podium by angry workers uh, because they're upset with what's happening in South Africa. In Sri Lanka, you have workers who are demanding that the government, the entire government, step down which may happen sometime this month. So workers are on the march. That's part of the good news, at least in a good deal of planet Earth. And once again, and I'd like to reiterate this point that I'll also explore further tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern, time for an awakening, is that Right now, it seems like the leading capitalist countries are stuck. Now, that doesn't mean that they can't pull it out. As they say in U.S. football, they can still hit a Hail Mary pass. But as I analyze the state of affairs, it seems as if most options are now blocked for the leading capitalist countries. But we shall see. Let me ask you this last question, sir. Uh, the what role did Eastern European immigrants play in the creation of May Day in Chicago? Well, I would say the European immigrants generally, not just Eastern Europeans, Irish Americans, who are, of course, at the heart of Western Europe. Uh, European Euro Americans generally played a role. That's why the, uh, the May Day was born in USA. You know, people were struggling. Uh, for workers' rights and for uh, workers' benefits. And it's, it's, it's well for a person like myself to mention that, since I'm oftentimes critical of the class collaborationist tendencies that is all too prevalent amongst too many Euro-American workers. But the birth of May Day does illustrate that that class collaborationist tendency uh, is not inevitable. And we know it's not inevitable because May Day shows that uh, there is another tendency at play. Uh, let me say, let me add, uh, the, let me ask you this final question: Was there um, didn't they uh, the, the um, ruling circles in America attempt to use the Eastern Europeans? Uh, they, they they because of the the uh, Southern Euros were. Uh, you know, they they played the race card, well, the, the state played the race card, and the Eastern Europeans were brought in in order to break break the strikes of the uh, the Euro-American workers, or am I incorrect, am I correct or incorrect in saying that? Well, sure. I mean, and of course, they were treated in a very disparaging way. You're old enough to remember the term quote, honky, unquote, which was yes, a term yes, many black people ascribe to Euro-Americans generally. Its etymological roots stems from a time 
when that was the descriptor applied in a disparaging manner to workers, particularly from Eastern Europe, for example, Hungary, for example. So, but as often as times happened, they were able to cl climb the, the cl class ladder, climb the greasy pole of success. And oftentimes as they were climbing the ladder, they were stepping over the rungs of cadavers comprised of Native Americans and black people. It's a typical U.S. tale. Only in America, as Don King would say. And I remember it was George Jackson who viciously opposed people using the term hunky, cracker, redneck, pecklewood. He was, uh, he was, uh, uh, he was into, as he would say, he was definitely into ethnic solidarity, but he did not like uh, African people to to say anything disparaging about any other group, even the Europeans. I know that was one of his one of his strong points. Yes, and that reminds me. Sometimes you you need to play Bob Dylan's song about George Jackson. Lord, Lord, shot George Jackson down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I play up here. Yeah, that there, there are three or four different versions. One with uh, uh, Big Band. Yeah, we'll do that. He also right did on. a song with Reuben Carter. Yeah, mm -hmm. about Reuben Carter. Pardon me. Is there anything that you'd like to add, Melinda or Gerald? No, time to sign off. All right. Uh, any closing words, uh, uh, Melinda Francis? We'll see everyone in the whirlwind next week. <laughs>